Hi there, namaste, kem chho. This is Ketan Gajjar from the very Apnu Ahmedabad. Welcome to the Recruitment Curry podcast. John, hi, thanks for being the guest on the Recruitment Curry podcast. Uh, without further ado, you know, obviously, if, if you can introduce yourself, uh, you know, mainly from the moneymaker's perspective, because that's what the recruiters like. Sure. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be here, Katan. Um, so I'm John Ruffini. I've, I've been in professional recruiting for the brunt of my career over 25 years now. I stopped counting at 25. So I just say over 25 now and uh, and, you know, grew up on a desk doing permanent placement in professional line sectors, full cycle recruitment, business development and recruitment. And over the years, held various management jobs at local, regional and national levels. And the past 10 to 15 years of my career, I really spent in a training, mentoring and professional development role, helping recruiters become better, whether they're new recruiters or veteran recruiters looking to tweak their performance. So I currently work in the healthcare staffing field where I've been since 2017, I'm vice president of professional development for a company called Health Trust Workforce Solutions, and we are part of HCA Healthcare, which is the largest for-profit hospital system in the United States. Uh, I have a team here, and myself and my team are committed to developing people and helping them be the best that they can be. And my personal focus is obviously on the recruiters of the company. Awesome. So, John, it's an honor to host you. You know, obviously, with 25 years plus experience, uh, th- there's there's a lot I'm sure you know you, you have on mind to discuss. But today, you know, what we want to cover is uh, the importance of planning and processes. You know, especially from the recruiter's perspective. You, you know, it's interesting. One thing that I've always pride my, that I always pride myself on is, although I've been in the industry a long time, I haven't been stagnant, if you know what I mean. It, it's very important to me to evolve with the way the industry is evolving. So the way that I used to do business 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, is not the way that a recruiter can do business today because it just changes. So the fundamentals of recruiting don't change, but the way that a recruiter conducts business, they have to evolve, right? So when we talk about planning, I've always been passionate about planning and processes. And I'm a big believer in consistency and accountability. So the way I always tell people, the way that I used to plan is not the way that I plan now and is not the way that I advise recruiters how to plan. Um, so it, it's, you know, the thing I like to say about planning is there's no one way to do it. I always tell recruiters that it is, planning can be the difference between being a successful recruiter and an unsuccessful recruiter. It's the Achilles heel of recruiting in any sales professional, because if you don't plan, then your day eats you alive. And there's few things that we're able to have control over in life. And one of them is how we spend our time. So it's important to at least start the day with a plan and then see what happens next. Sure. So from the recruiter's perspective, especially for the the newbies in the, the industry, how do you suggest they go about planning? You know, what, what are those factors that, that, that they should consider, you know, when they start that day? Well, they have to, they have to first figure out what's important, right? Planning is all about prioritizing and constantly reprioritizing throughout your day. So the recruiter has to figure out, all right, first you kind of work back. So I would set goals. All right. I start with how much money do I want to make this year? Because as a recruiter, usually that's part of the reason why you get into the business. It's an opportunity to earn a good living. And then based on that, okay, well, what's the activity I have to do in order to achieve that goal? Great. And you can break that down into an annual, monthly, even daily occurrence. And then you say, okay, now that I know what I have to do, when during the day am I going to do that? And then you block out times in the day to execute certain activities that you know will lead you farther down the line toward placements. And so that's the concept of how to plan. And I'm a big believer in time blocking your day. And once you time block your day, the challenge is, can you stick to that plan? And you will be interrupted. So when you get interrupted, then you have to say, all right, do I take this interruption? Do I not take this interruption? Is it more important than what I'm working on now or is it not? And that's where the self-discipline comes in. But once you have that, it's important. And within those blocks, for example, recruiters are going to spend a lot of time making phone calls. 
I'll give you an example. So if I block my time out and I'm looking for certain people to recruit and source during these times, there's two ways to go about it. So I can get to that time block and then start looking for people to call. Or I can do the work up front the evening before and build a call list so that when I get to that time block, I can start dialing. The latter will yield infinitely more results than the former. So it's actually planning within planning. But the key to it is once you have your plan mapped out, I always, you probably, I mean, see me, I say it every week on LinkedIn to remind myself and my followers, yep. plan your work, work your plan. So yeah, I can make a plan. I can plan my work. But then when I go to work my plan from top to bottom, I'm going to be interrupted. So I've got to be nimble enough to say, all right, there's a good chance that some of this won't get done today, but can I make sure that it's that I'm, that I'm focusing on the most important things and I do get those done. Sure. And then, you know, interesting, you mentioned about, you know, uh, planning your day uh, at the latter part of the day, you know, so that next morning you, you're ready, you know, when you come in. And that's that's one dilemma that a lot of uh, new recruiters, you know, when they come into the industry, they have is, oh, can I call the, let's say the candidates, you know, early in the morning, you know, let, let's say seven, half seven or, you know, eight o'clock uh, a.m. And then, they sort of put off stuff, you know, probably until 10. That's when they, the candidates get busy. So w- w- what are your thoughts on, you know, especially uh, the, the, the fear and procrastination, you know, obviously they, they link it to, into planning very well, which derails the entire day, isn't it? it yeah. And, and there's, it's also, you know, it's very easy. Today's recruiters, the newer ones, they also want to resort to text and email more than the phone. A, because it's easy, but B, you know, what I say is use those mediums because they're important these days. If you have a mobile number for someone, maybe they'll respond to a text better or an email. You don't know how people are going to react. It should complement your phone efforts, not replace it. But as far as, you know, you've got to try different times in the day. You never know when a candidate's going to be available. So, you know, I would tend to plan. I do two things. I plan at the end of my day before I shut down. And then I also plan before I start the next day because something could have happened overnight that adjusts my plan. So I have to allow for that. So again, I don't care when you plan or how you plan. I just care that you plan. And for recruiters, it it amazes me still to this day when I talk about recruiting and I was like, okay, well, how do I get in touch with this person? Like, well, I don't have a phone number. Well, I don't have an email. I'm like, do you know where they work? Yeah. Call their work. And the recruiters look at me like, can I do that? And I'm like, of course you can. <laughs> You're a recruiter. <laughs> so that, that, that proactiveness needs to, needs to be there for a recruiter to be successful. Now, would I call someone at seven in the morning? Typically, no. Would I call someone at nine at night? Typically, no, unless they gave me permission to do so. So you want to be respectful of a person's life, obviously. Of course. And then, you know, th- that links it back to the, the process part, you know, when you said that if, if there's no phone number uh, or an email address, you know, what do you do? And then, wh- which is why, you know, the, the, the topic of uh, importance of planning and process, isn't it? So how, how do you think, uh, you know, f- f- from the, the vanilla method of just sourcing that, okay, fine, you know, I will only call the candidate if I've got the contact details on the resume. Uh, what approach would you sort of suggest? And this is mainly, again, you know, for, for the, the newbies in the industry that they, they look out and sort of just, you know, look, look, look within the resume that, okay, fine, you know, I, I don't have it, you know, off you go. I'm going to sort of just move on. You know, it's interesting. I, my advice to recruiters is to call everyone, talk to everyone. There's no such thing as a bad conversation if the person is within your recruiting space. Are you able to place everyone you talk to? Absolutely not. But you can give them a good experience. You can add value to their career in some way. And they know other people. So every call is a link to your next candidate or your next client or both. So I always say, when in doubt, just pick up the phone and call. Don't look at a resume and analyze it so much that you talk yourself out of calling the person. You know, if they're in the industry, they, they may have, not everybody can write a good resume. And there are really strong, talented people that write awful resumes. And there are really 
not so talented people that write great resumes. So, you know, it, talk to everybody and don't be afraid to have those conversations. And, um, you know, the approach is key, Katan. I, I, I always, you know, I always believe that the recruiter, when you approach candidates, you have to earn the right to work with them. And you do that by getting to know them and understanding them as a person and what's important to them and what they want. So I may have a job I'm trying to fill for my client or for my company, but there's no way I can know if you're good for that job until I get to know you. So if I'm a recruiter and I call you and I say, hey, I'm looking at your background, you'd be perfect fit for this job. That's that's very assumptive of me when I haven't even gotten to know you. So yep. I tend to call folks, introduce myself, say, hey, I don't know if I can help you or, or not, but I'm in your space. I network with folks like you. I learn what you want in your career. And if I come across an opportunity that makes sense, you get the luxury of a phone call. And and I go ver- go about it from a very much, let's build a relationship and see if this is mutually beneficial versus I want you for this particular job, if that makes sense. Totally does. So, so John, you know, when it comes to planning, and this is we are talking about, you know, planning before approaching a candidate. What, you know, what factors do you think uh, recruiters should plan, you know, before they actually pick up a call and then, you know, start having a conversation? Great question. So, again, you don't want to overthink it. But when I call a candidate, number one, I try to group my my calls in like blocks, if you will. So whatever I'm recruiting, it's easier on my mind if, okay, I'll take, so what industries does your team recruit for? Accounting. Okay. So let's take accounting. So let's say I'm recruiting staff accountants. I'm going to have a call block where that's all I'm calling is staff accountants. If I have a block and I'm calling a staff accountant, then a financial analyst, then a CFO, then an accounting manager, my brain is working way too hard. So I want to call a bunch of staff accountants one right after the other because it's going to be a similar conversation and I'll have similar opportunities to discuss. So I want to make sure that I've got a really strong introduction, who I am, what I do, and why I'm calling. And I want to make sure that I highlight what's in it for them to speak with me. Um, And ideally, if I can personalize that in some way, then that's even better. More important in electronic communication. So if I have your resume or if I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile and I can say, hey, the reason I'm looking out to you, reaching out to you is because I notice you have some great experience with SEC reporting at such and such a company. That lets the person know that I took the time to read a little bit about them, which in today's world is very essential. Of course. And then the, the other part that you mentioned is, you know, ha- have, have blocks of roles. So if, if, if you're working on similar jobs, then, you know, just, 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 you know, contact the candidates in that space rather than, you know, being all over. Sure. And because let's face it, recruiters, we're going to get voicemail a lot. So if I'm going to be leaving voicemails, if I'm leaving the same voicemail on every call, because I'm calling a similar skilled group, then I become better with each call. If I'm having to adjust that and leave different messages on every call, then I'm starting from scratch every time. Um, I'm also a believer in scripts. So, you know, whenever I believe if you write your own script, it doesn't sound like a script. So whenever I make calls to this day, I've got a script in front of me. It's not that I don't know what to say, but rather than think about what to say, I just want to worry about how I'm going to say it. And that's where that can add a lot of value. So it's it's a great guide to to have a script because you know if if you're using somebody else's script you you're going to sound verbatim you know at the most. Sure, yeah. Like if if I wrote a script for you or you wrote a script for me, when we said it, it would sound like a script because we didn't write it. But if you yeah. write it for yourself, it it's not going to sound like a script. It's just going to make you sound more confident, and that's something that's important because you've got that limited space to make a first impression with that candidate. And if you're stumbling over your words or you're running on and on and it's too long and you lots of ums and uhs in between, it doesn't sound as confident. And candidates want to work with folks that they believe in and that they trust. And part of that is that first impression and building that confidence. Sure. So so from the process perspective, John, you know, when it comes to, you know, being confident in front of the candidates, what factors in, in your opinion, you know, really, you know, play a major role? 
gosh, the, the biggest one is an intangible. And it's, it's just that, that self-belief, uh, belief in yourself and belief in what you're doing. If, as a recruiter, if you pick up that phone and you don't believe that the opportunities you have will benefit someone's career, then you've already lost. You've got to believe in the value that you're adding. You've got to believe that the person that you contact, you have a chance to impact their lives and they have an impact chance to impact a company's performance. And you got to get excited about that. If if you're not excited, they will not be excited. So it's that it's that personal even if you're brand new and it's day 1, I've had people that I've hired that had no experience and they get on the phone and they act like they've done it for 10 years. That's what you have to do. You have to decide early on, here's who I am, here's what I can do. It's not cocky, it's confidence. And even before you make it, you know, it's that that old phrase fake it till you make it. There is something to that. And and you have to just have that confidence. You can't be you can't be weak. Totally, and, and th- that's one feedback I, I I give my recruiters that the, the the only medium that your candidates and your prospects have is your voice. So if you don't sound True. confident, you know th- they won't trust you. They they wouldn't want to talk to you because you don't know you know what you want to talk about, and they don't have time to sort of just just waste talking to you. <laughs> exactly. So many recruiters. It, it's funny. I always say when you're recruiting, your goal with every call should really just to have a should, to, should be to have a conversation with the person on the other side. If your goal is, hey, I've got to recruit this person, you're going to lose sight of a lot of information that you'll learn. So just have a conversation and see see where it goes. Maybe it goes somewhere, maybe it doesn't, but you can usually learn something. And to your point, the only thing you have is your voice. So, you know, you tell people, it sounds stupid, but it's true. Smile when you talk because that makes you sound better. I used to be one, you know, when I'm on the phone, recruiting, I'm, ten, I'm pretty much, I'm up, I'm walking, I'm using my hands and I've got energy flowing because that's just, that's how I like to operate. I'd be pacing back and forth while I'm talking on the phone. Um, you know, if you're slunched over your desk and you're kind of talking like this, like, oh, I got to make these 10 calls now, that's going to come through. And who's going to want to work with someone like that? Of course. And then the, the objective is very different. And, you know, you touched upon this point, like when you, when you were recruiting probably, you know, 20 years back, uh, recruitment was different. Recruiting is different now. Of course, the fundamentals are, you know, obviously the, the basics are same. But when it comes to, you know, engaging with the candidates, you know, previously, you know, the, the objective was, yes, you know, I, I'm going to interview this, this this person. But, you know, r- r- like you mentioned right now, have a con- conversation. Now, that's one part of the process. Not a lot of recruiters, you know, are either trained or, you know, they, they're still following the old methodology of that. Yes, you know, I have to interview this candidate and, you know, I'll just go question, 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 rather than having a conversation. They, they get into order taking mode. Um, and the beautiful thing is, you know, I, I will tell you, I still get on the phone today. I, I've made it a point not to be completely removed from the field because I want to be in tune with what's going on. And re- new recruiters are amazed because I sit down and I've got my form with me, my, you know, screening form for the candidate. It's got all the, the data pieces that I need to obtain, but I don't, follow it like an order taking, like, okay, number one, tell me how long you've been with your company. Number two, how did you, you know, all that kind of stuff. You want to have a conversation. You want to talk to someone. I always tell people, if you're talking to a friend at a restaurant or in your living room and you wanted to talk with them about their job, how would you do it? You just have a conversation. How are things going? What are you up to? Oh, what do you think is going to happen next? Like there's no, it's no different. You know, have that conversation, get to know the person and in the conversation, it will reveal a lot of the information you need to determine whether or not it makes sense for the two of you to work together. Absolutely. And then, so, so one, more, one more thing that I follow is, you know, conversations lead to conversions. Mm, I like that. And I, 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 I like borrowed that. this I may, from, I may steal uh, that from you. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I stole it from, uh, you know, the, the, this book I read, uh, you know, the, the author is Chris Smith. And then the book is on marketing. On, on, you know, how to leverage marketing. And, you know, that, that's one point he's mentioned that, you know, conversations, you know, lead to conversions. I like that. It's very true. So, you know, unless you, you, you talk to a lot of people, you know, unless you sort of converse, irrespective of the medium, you know, with engage with most people, you know, it's, it's all about the volume. I, I know, you know, obviously there's more emphasis on the quality, but unless you increase your, your input, you know, you, you're not going to see the increase in the output. You've got to have both. You're absolutely right. And, and the more the more seasoned you get as a recruiter, 
then the easier it is for you to have less volume because you're more experienced and you're more connected. So you might be able to get a referral or two really quick and you don't have to talk to 20 or 30 people. Early on, you've got to talk to as many people as will allow you to talk to them. Exactly, exactly. So, so well, you know, uh, uh, you know, f- f- linking both planning and process, John, what are three elements, you know, from a new recruiter's perspective that you'd want uh, them to work on? So let's say, you know, it's, it's my first job uh, into a staffing firm. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, all, all, all my background is, you know, either call center or, you know, some industrial sales. Uh, what, what would you suggest uh, for somebody like me, you know, who's just walked in day one? Do I just pick up the phone? Do I, you know, review the, the, the jobs? What do I do? Well, it, it's, uh, when I say trust the process, it depends on what process you're trusting, but you have to trust whatever you're trusting. When you join a company, typically they will have a process. And sure. if they don't have a process, then I say, find the person who's the most successful recruiter and learn from them and, and just do what they do. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you know, internally, if there's, you know, if people are willing to train you and they're teaching you the ways of the business, learn the ways that learn the fundamentals. That's number one, learn the fundamentals of the business in everything in life. If you're not grounded in the fundamentals, you'll never succeed. And that goes for business, for sports, for everything. So learn the fundamentals of the business first. Once you have learned the fundamentals, then develop a style that works for you you know, figure out how am I going to interview candidates and make it consistent so that you're working efficiently. You know, I always tell people when you watch me interview someone, if I interviewed 10 people, you would see the same thing 10 different times because I've developed a flow of how I traverse that conversation. And for the most part, it's the same, different nuances based on the candidate. So learn the fundamentals, adapt them to your personality, and then just work your butt off. Because, you know, that sounds, these, these are very basic tenets that I live by, but the difference between you and your competitor often is not who's smarter than the other or who's, you know, better than the other. It's who outworks the other person. And then I, I live by that quote, actually, you know, that, that's one quote by uh, Henry Ford. Uh, I've been following that the competitor you should fear is the one who puts his head down without worrying about, you know, anybody else. And then you obviously really works so let me just uh, you know tell you you know it's it's an amazing quote it's actually my uh, you know pinned tweet on twitter i love that uh, it's it's the competitor to be feared is one who never bothers about you at all but goes on making his own business better all the time love that and it's so true you know you as you should be always be in competition with yourself first you know get a little bit better each day and if you do that then you don't you don't worry about the competition. It's not like, oh, I've got to, because if I'm so focused on you, then I'm less focused on me. I'm more consumed with how you're doing than am I getting better. So, you know, always try and get a little bit better each day and learn, you know, don't be afraid to fail either. That's the only way we learn. And that's exactly, you know, the the part of planning and process that, you know, when you're planning, you know, you, you don't block the time to worry about your competitor. If you want to, you know, you probably block five minutes. And then move on. That's a great. That's a great point. Now I might, I might research some of my competitors, but, uh, but, but I'm not going to spend time, you know, worrying about them. But it's it's good if you're in a market where, you, I, I, I used to recruit in local spaces because I was in accounting and finance and IT. So we met all of our candidates in person, and I would go to networking events where there would be other recruiters. And I'd meet my competitors. I thought it was good to get to know them and kind of see what they did and how they worked together uh, and, and what they did and how I might be able to learn from them. Um, a lot of people with LinkedIn, when, you know, they're always saying, you know, well, should I make my network private so that other recruiters don't steal my contacts? And I was never worried about that. I'm like, if someone steals a relationship from me, that's my fault, not theirs. You know, totally. I, I, I'll build a strong enough relationship where I'm not worried about that. True, true. And then again, so, so that, that's, that's the part of the process, isn't it? Uh, relationship building. You know, how, how, how strong is your relationship with your clients and candidates? Ketan, that's our whole business, right? We, recruiting is a relationship business. Uh, at least that's how I look at it. And it's not just for the person I place today. I want to place that person in their next four jobs. 
So I want to build that relationship so that they continue to look to me, not just as a person that has access to great jobs, but someone who's a resource within the talent community, someone that can provide me information about the job market, the climate, what's good, what's not, what companies are hiring, what companies are not hiring. That's where you can really deepen the relationship. That first placement is just the beginning. That should be the start of your relationship. And you need to always continue to try and earn that respect from your candidates and do things that add value to those candidates so that they come back to you and they refer their colleagues to you. And that only happens when you have conversations, isn't it? Not interview people. I love the way you brought that back to the conversation. And so it's true. It's true. You know, you've got to be, you've got to be a real person and you've got to treat them like a person. Don't treat them like a piece of meat or a placement or a candidate. They're a person. So get to know them first and then worry about recommending jobs. You know, if you have a conversation and you get to know what's important to a candidate, and then you come back and say, okay, based on what you've told me, I want to tell you about a couple opportunities that would benefit your career. It's based on what they wanted. It's not, I have this job and I'm hoping you'll like it. So it, it's, a, it's a totally different equation. And it surprises me that the majority of recruiters do not do that. So it's easy to, to differentiate yourself. And, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, who you're working with, you know, from the process perspective, uh, following those fundamentals, you know, because, you know, if, if you're trained uh, to just have a transactional relationship, then you're nev never going to have conversations with, with your candidates or clients. You know, you're always going to look at them as currency that, oh, you know, I've got this candidate, I've got to place them and, you know, I'm going to make a fee out of it. Of course, you will make a fee out of it, but you will make more fees in the future if you have conversations rather than just look at them as a one-time transaction. Couldn't agree more. 100% right. So a anything else, John, you you'd want to you know share uh, from the planning and process perspective uh, for our listeners? You know, we've covered a lot, of, a lot of good basis and you could talk about planning till we're blue in the face. Again, everybody's going to have a different way to plan and some of them do it you know, and find a tool that works for you, find a method that works for you. And as your life gets busier and different, don't be afraid to change that tool. Okay. I used to be very much a handheld. I needed to see my plan. So I had a day timer, you know, a planner and I'd write it down in there. And then several years back, I was like, okay, I used to keep it on Outlook, but I'd also have it in my day timer because I had to see it. And I never wanted to be without that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to ditch the the paper and I'm going to go completely electronic and it's worked out really well for me. But you know, don't be afraid to change and adapt and learn from others. I I've in our industry that's how everybody grows is we learn from what other people do and people will share their best practices. Um it it amazes me how how willing people are to help each other get better. So, you know, learn from folks, be inquisitive, be real inquisitive as a recruiter, always be curious and always be asking questions so that you can figure out, you know, I'd want to go to the successful recruiters in my company, in my market and say, how do you plan and learn from them? How do you control your day? And then go to someone who's kind of like mid-level. How do you plan your day? And then go to someone who might be in it for six months. Okay. How do you plan your day? Figure out how they do it because you'll learn some great practices that you can adapt. Now. If you're already a really good planner, don't change. But in this industry, there's so much going on that you're bound to get disorganized if you don't have a plan. <laughs> very true. Very true. And then, John, John uh, you know, obviously, I'd like you to talk something about your, your book, uh, Money Makers. You know, this book? <laughs> Absolutely. That one. Um, so, Money Makers, when I talk about my my passion for the fundamentals of recruiting. That's what Money Makers is all about. It, you know, in the book are what I consider 52 fundamental practices to be successful in recruiting. And I chose 52 because I figured, okay, they're 52 weeks in a year and you can work on one money maker each week of the year rather than trying to take the whole book and digest it and apply everything at once because that never works. So you read a chapter, you say, great, there's one. Let me focus on that for this week. Once I'm comfortable with that, let me go to the next chapter. Okay, now I'm going to integrate that. And if you do that, you will 
get a really good grounding foundation in the fundamentals of the business from which you can grow on. So that's the whole premise be, behind the book. Um, and, and I've been real happy with it and people seem to be, be happy with it as well. So that's very gratifying. That's how I found you, you know, in the first staffing summit, you, know, you were a speaker there and I said, you know, I got to talk to John. That's right. That's where we first met. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, uh, yeah, you know, the, it's, 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 it's amazing. And you, you mentioned about, you know, reaching out to experienced folks in, in the industry to help. And, you know, that's exactly what I've done. You know, I reached out to you, uh, you know, asking for a favor to come on the podcast and you happily apply, obliged, actually. That's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, it's, again, we've developed a relationship with each other. You know, do we talk every day? No, but no. we've communicated and we've stayed in touch since that first time we met. And you know, when we have the, the opportunity when we bump into each other at conferences. It's great. But other than that, you know, the beauty of technology allows us to stay in touch with one another and track each other. So, you know, that's what I love about this business is, is you can develop relationships with folks and maintain them. Um, but you have to be willing to do that. And, and you, of course, have been. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then can't agree more. I mean, it's, it's a relationship business at the end of the day. Uh, can't be transactional unless you know you want to just be in it for probably a couple of years and then just move on <laughs> right which which we're not <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not absolutely not so so john you know it's 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 been an honor once again uh to to host you on the recruitment curry uh you know as a guest and uh, you know look forward to more insights uh, I, I love the you know plan your day uh, hashtag uh, that you have and then work your plan uh, totally agree with it uh, big fan and then I do Thank sort you. of recommend that to my team. Uh, but thanks once again uh, from the recruitment curry, uh, India. It's uh, eleven. I love the name, by the way. That the name of the podcast makes me hungry. <laughs> uh, do, do, do you like curry? Do, 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 do you I, like curry? I do if it's if it's not too spicy. My wife loves very hot curry. She loves Indian food. Um, I like it, but not real spicy. Well, you know, now, you know, with the globalization, you know, the curry is no longer, you know, it, it's either too spicy or it, it, it's, it's either totally bland. I'll take the totally bland. <laughs> My wife will take the spicy. I'll take the bland. <laughs> no, I mean, which is why I came up with the name, you know, the, the recruitment curry, because, you know, it, it, it's, it's got to be a blend of all the spices, you know, to, to make it work. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to taste good. It's a great analogy. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, John, once again. And, and uh, you know, obviously look forward to catching up on LinkedIn and, you know, on, on your messages and posts and, and uh, the Stuffing Shark, you know, podcast as well. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you and great to talk with you. Thanks, John. 